I am uh, very happy to reintroduce to you uh, Professor Nancy Kanwisher from the Brain and Cognitive Science Department at MIT. She's arguably one of the very best and most engaging speakers. Uh, so I think you will really enjoy this uh, presentation. So Nancy, all yours. Thanks, Gabriel. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry we're not all gathering together in, uh, in Woods Hole. That would be lovely. I'm actually four miles from there right now myself, lucky me. Uh, and I hope you will all get to come there someday and we can meet in person. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to start with some good news, which is that in the last few decades, uh, my field of cognitive neuroscience has made what I think is a lot of progress delivering this glorious picture of the functional organization of the human brain. Uh, what this highly schematic diagram is meant to show is that there are now dozens of regions of the cortex in humans for which we have a pretty good idea of what that little patch of cortex does. Uh, and each of these regions is present in approximately the same location in pretty much every normal person. And this includes regions that carry out not just sensory functions, but very abstract, high-level, um, quintessentially human functions, uh, like understanding language, perceiving music, and thinking about what another person is thinking. And I think that is just pretty awesome. I think of this as a kind of initial sketch of who we are as human beings, um, and that's great. Uh, but at the same time, this picture here is just the barest beginning, leaving so many questions unanswered. Uh, and so what I want to do today um, is first, oh, that's to remind me to say, to fit in kind of some newer stuff in this talk, I kind of skipped all the stuff I used to do to kind of say how you end up with a map like this of the brain. Um, but if anybody has not heard of, you know, some of the basics of functional MRI and wants some background on that, if you just go, uh, in fact, you just Google CBMM videos, Heineken, whatever. Actually, Chris, maybe you could put that, that Heineken talk in the, um, in the uh, chat window. Um, it'll give some more background to, uh, you know, what are the actual experiments you do to end up with a picture like this? Okay, so what I want to do today, skipping that background, is talk in a more serious way about functional, what functional selectivity in the cortex means, whether it actually really exists, and why we might have it. And for this, I'm gonna focus on this patch of the ventral visual pathway here um, that contains regions that respond selectively to faces, places, and bodies. And I'm gonna, gonna consider three questions about category selectivity in the cortex. The first one is, what does it even mean to say that a region responds selectively to faces, places, or bodies? Uh, my colleague, Jim DiCarlo, who you heard a few days ago, um, would often say, quite disparagingly, that's just a word model. And for a long time when Jim said that, I thought it was kind of annoying and pedantic, and he knows damn well what a face is, and why is he bugging me with this? Um, but eventually, after a few years, I've come around to realize he actually has a good point. Uh, and I think his point is that saying that a patch of cortex responds selectively to faces, for example, is not a computationally explicit hypothesis. Um, because we have no way to say, other than asking people, does this image count as a face, place, or body? So it's kind of imprecise or subjective in that sense. Uh, but also, uh, it, it doesn't explain what we know to be stable differences in the magnitude of response of a face selective region or a place or body selective region to the face region to different faces, the place region to different places, body region to different bodies. So we know those are stable, different magnitudes of response. And just saying that a region is um, face, place, or body selective doesn't capture um, that stable variation. Second question I want to consider is, does this category, is this category selectivity even true? And so, in fact, there's loads of evidence that supports the selectivity of the fusiform face area for faces, the parahippocampal place area for places, and the extra striate body area for bodies. Uh, and that's part of that stuff in that peer talk you can go listen to and it'll show you some of those data. Um, but these claims of selectivity are inherently reckless hypotheses. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it would be very easy for them to be refuted. So if somebody comes along and says, hey, I scanned some subjects, I found the fusiform face area and I measured its response to faces and objects and pineapples. And hey, it responds as much or more to pineapples as to faces. Then the jig's up. Then it's not face selective. 
Uh, and the thing is that there are a huge number of these other stimuli for which nobody has measured the magnitude of response of those other images in any of these regions. So it'd be very easy in principle for somebody to come along and refute any of these hypotheses. And that means people like me who are proponents of pretty strong category selectivity are in a kind of vulnerable, vulnerable position, just kind of waiting for somebody to come along and refute our hypotheses. I mean, it's kind of a good thing. You want hypotheses that are refutable. Otherwise, they're not substantive, but it's a vulnerable situation as well. Third question I'll consider is, why does the brain have functionally specific patches of cortex in the first place? Why, from a computational point of view, is that a good way to design a brain? And why sh should we have the particular specializations in the brain that we do? Um, and so how can we address these questions? Well, what I'll argue today is that convolutional neural networks are actually enormously empowering and enable us to, enabling us to address all three questions. And this is a little funny coming from me because up until, you know, as little as a year and a half, two years ago, I was still thinking, oh God, do I have to learn about these things? Uh, I don't really know about them. Uh, maybe I'll ignore them and they'll go away. Uh, but I've quite come around. And in fact, uh, Josh Tenenbaum was making fun of me yesterday uh, saying that I'm uh, in love with deep neural networks. And it's kind of true. I'm, I'm in an infatuation phrase, a phase by which I mean, uh, you know, the kind of situation where you're not as deeply knowledgeable about something to actually see all the downsides. Right now I'm in the kind of rosy tinted glasses. We can do everything with them. So I'll give you that picture now and then, you know, maybe I'll get over this in a, in a year or two. Anyway, um, so what do I mean by we can use convolutional neural networks to address these questions? Well, first, to deal with the first question, what I'm going to argue is we can build CNN-based encoding models that predict the response of each region to new images. Um, and then, once we have those models, if they're highly predictive, we can use them to turbocharge our search for evidence against category selectivity. And that's what you want to do to strongly test a hypothesis. This is, you know, Karl Popper's theory of uh, science, how science should go is we should try to refute our hypotheses in the strongest way possible. And I'll argue that these CNN models can help us do that. And then third, we can use them to ask why, whether and why category selectivity might emerge spontaneously just from task optimization. So that's the agenda. I'll start with this first uh, question. This is work led by Ratan Murthy. Um, along with Kuya Bashavan uh, and Jim DiCarlo and an undergrad researcher in the lab, Alex Abate. Okay, so first, I'm sure you guys don't need a basic reminder on CNNs, but just to kind of upload into all of our heads what I'm referring to here. Um, the relevant facts are, first of all, since roughly 2012, these things are suddenly doing really well on visual recognition tasks. And that's important because it provides the first image computable models of how recognition uh, might work in primates. And I just wanna take a second to underline how astonishing and radical and new that is. So Jim DiCarlo and I used to teach this grad seminar on object recognition. We taught it for like a decade, ending pretty much just before this happened. And at the time, we addressed all these side questions, like, okay, what is, you know, is, is visual recognition modulated by attention? Can we activate the same regions with mental imagery? Are there double dissociations between these different categories of objects? All these kind of side questions. And Jim kept saying, like, these are all side questions. I wanna know how actually does visual recognition work? And I just thought, wow, that's good for him, but nobody has a clue, because actually nobody had a clue. Um, and now all of a sudden we have working models that aren't you know, quite as good as humans and they're not exactly the same as humans, but it's like now we have hypotheses to test and this is just a huge game changing event. Okay, second of all, uh, as I'm sure you've also heard a bit, these models um, actually match the primate ventral visual pathway to a remarkable degree. So this um, really seminal paper by um, Dan Yamans and Jim DiCarlo and others from 2014 showed this stunning graph here, uh, which shows in black the magnitude of response of some little site in IT, not an individual neuron, but a site, maybe like average of 10,000 neurons or something in that, in that region, um, actually fewer, probably hundreds of neurons. Um, 
And uh, so here's its magnitude of response in black to a bunch of different kinds of stimuli. And you can see it's a face selective neuron, it responds a whole bunch more to faces than other things. But in red is the predicted response of that site based only on a linear weighted sum of units from a CNN model trained on other stimuli. So that shows extremely accurate prediction of what this single site in a monkey brain is doing. So that's pretty amazing. Um, and next, we even find not just ability to predict what units are doing in monkey brains, but we find a correspondence of layers such that for human brains, early layers of the network correspond to early stages of processing in the human visual system like V1, V2, V3. Mid layers correspond to mid layers of the visual system and high layers to kind of higher layers of processing. So there's not just an overall ability to model these things uh, with net, the, these brain regions with networks, but a kind of correspondence among layers. So that's awesome. So what I want to do today is say, okay, can we use these, these methods, these CNN-based models, to make predictive models of the FFA, PPA, and EBA? Okay, so how do we do that? We scan subjects while they view a broad range of images, 185 natural images shown here, 25 faces, 50 bodies, et cetera. Um, and we have 20 repetitions per image. So subjects are scanned for 10 hours a piece, not all in one go, uh, but it's a lot because we want really high quality, accurate measures of response uh, to each of these images individually. And that gives us this 185 dimensional vector of the response of each region or voxel in that person's brain to each of these 185 images, okay? So what we can do then is functionally define the FFA, PPA, and EBA, and the standard way we do that is we scan subjects in other experiments where they're looking at faces and objects and the bits that respond more to faces and objects on the bottom of the brain give you those, those brown blobs for this subject here, right and left FFA. And similarly, scenes versus objects gives you the PPA and bodies versus objects gives you the EBA. Once we've identified those regions, now we can say how, uh, what is the mean magnitude of MRI response in those regions to each of these 185 stimuli. So that gives us, for example, here's the right FFA, that little patch right there. Each row is a different voxel, a different like two by two by three millimeter uh, cube uh, or rectangle out of the uh, out of the um, that region of the brain and its average magnitude of response and so you can see the face selectivity here by the higher the colors are the magnitude of MRI response and they're higher for faces than body scenes or objects and so we can also see each uh, column is a different image where there's 185 here and so here we've got the magnitude of response of this person's um, right FFA to each of these stimuli okay so now that we have that, we can say, let's try to build a CNN-based model that tries to predict the FFA response to novel images. So we do that by taking 90% of the stimuli in this set, uh, and we come up with a bunch of weights from a bunch of units um, in a given layer of the network. So say we take this layer here, and we take a bunch of units here, and we, add, uh, we've, we basically fit a different weight for each of these units, such that when you sum them up together, it fits the mean FFA response that we've observed. Okay, so we do that, fitting those weights for 90% of the stimuli in this set, and then we test the ability of that model to predict responses in the held out 10%. And we do that by feeding it a new held out image, measuring the activation in, that, in those units in that layer, summing them up by their weights to get the predicted mean FFA response to that new image. And so the key questions are, does this work? And how well do we predict? Um, and can we predict the magnitude of response, not just to the category, like faces are gonna be higher than bodies or objects, but to the individual image, even for novel images that weren't uh, fit in the, in the um, development of this model. Okay, so does that work? Well, here's data from one subject and here, here's a given data points. Each dot represents the predicted and observed response of the fusiform face area to a single stimulus, given image, okay? So the key question then is, um, are we gonna find um, a strong correlation between predicted and observed? 
uh, if that model works really well, then we'll be able to predict the response to novel images and we'll get something kind of like a scatter around a line. And if not, it will be a mock, a circle of dots. So what do we see? We see a damned good fit. Overall correlation of 0.86. Um, the different colors are preferred and non-preferred. So those um, kind of aqua dots are uh, faces in this case, and the red dots are non-faces. And what we further see is even if you just look at the correlation within faces, it's still high, or within non-faces, it's also high. And so what this is telling us that, um, yeah, this works really well. Uh, and second, we're able to predict the magnitude of response very accurately, uh, not just for the overall category of the image, but to the particular novel image. So that's pretty cool, but that's just one subject and one region. What do we see in other subjects? This is what I showed you before. Well, first of all, that was actually this person's left hemisphere. Here's their right FFA. Um, and here are three other subjects. And you see in each subject, we get these very strong abilities to predict. Um, we can build a model of the FFA based on one subset of the data, test it on the held out data, and those predictions work extremely well, just from giving a set of linear weights uh, of units out of a deep net model. So that's the FFA. What about the extra striate body area that responds more to bodies than objects, uh, or the PPA? Well, here are the data for the EBA. And you see, again, very strong correlations between predicted and observed responses for each of our, our four subjects in each hemisphere. So that works well. What about the PPA? Again, very strong correlations in each subject individually. Uh, so that works well as well. So what have we done here? We've produced image computable models. That is, once we have this model, we can stick an image into the front end, measure the activations, you run it through our linear weighting summed thing and predict very accurately how strongly the FFA, PPA, and EBA will respond to that image. So that, um, and it's not, it's not just the overall category, it's the particular images. And further, uh, in data we have, we're actually still collecting online right now, we're showing that human judgments of face likeness, body likeness, or scene likeness don't do as well as, um, as our predictive models. And in fact, we seem to be beating experts in the field in predicting the magnitude of response of each region to each image. Further, these models work really well across uh, different subjects. So if you train up those weights based on the data from one subject and use them to predict on an another subject, that works very well, almost as well as uh, training and testing within a subject. So that's all cool, but I think these models shouldn't replace word models. They should complement them. We still need word models. Because after all, theories in psychology and development and evolution are not about random arbitrary shapes and uh, label-free vectors. They're about real things like faces, right? The evolutionary significance and psychological significance of faces really matter in, theory, in theories in these other domains. So we wanna uh, keep a bridge between those theories and what we see in the brain. So rather, I think what these models do is add precision um, to, and, and complement those word models. So further, we, that means because we still care about the word models, we need to know if they're correct. And that br brings us to our second question. So is category selectivity even true? As I mentioned, uh, people who claim category selectivity for these regions are in this vulnerable situation that any of a nearly infinite number of images could in principle be tested and shown to uh, refute the claimed hypothesized category selectivity. And only a tiny percent of non-faces have been tested for the FFA, so there's, we're wide open to, to refutation. And it's entirely possible somebody will come along and refute these hypotheses. But the challenge is, how do we know which of those things to test, right? So there's just this big space, how do we sample it? Over the first 10 years of studying these regions, we tried to think of all the alternative hypotheses we could think of, and we tested those, and these regions passed those tests. But who's to say that our imaginations are good enough to predict what the actually falsifying conditions would be? So the idea here is now we're gonna use our CNN-based model to turbocharge our search for non-face images that strongly drive the FFA 
and non-body images that drive the EBA and non-place images that drive the PPA. In other words, we're going to use these models to look for um, falsifying evidence against our claim, as good scientists should do. Okay, how do we do that? Uh, well, what we can do is we can take this model that, we, that I talked about in the first part, where we fitted the weights and shown that it's very um, good at predicting. And now we can just shove a huge number of images into the model and get a predicted mean response for each region. Okay, and we can do that on millions of stimuli. You just leave it running overnight. And so we did this on three and a half million stimuli from the ImageNet database, VGG face, uh, and VGG places. And we ran them all through here and we got predicted mean uh, FFA responses. And our agenda here is to look for any predicted high responses to the FFA of stimuli that are not faces. So what do we see? Um, well, here is a histogram of the number of stimuli and the predicted magnitude of FFA response. And you can see if you look at it that all the top FFA response images are all from VGG face. They're all front views of faces. So that's not too surprising. Um, but uh, what we need to do is look more closely at images from that top set. And we need to not include the stimuli from the face data set, because of course they're going to be up there. The question is these long tails. They have tails out here. And what are those images? Because this is a really, um, uh, there's a lot of images hiding in there in that skinny little tail. So what I'm going to uh, show you next is what are the stimuli that are predicted to give the highest response in the FFA from those 3 million stimuli that don't include VGG face? And here are the first 10 at the bottom. And let's scroll through the top 200. And so the deal is VG, ImageNet and VGG Place actually have some images with faces in them, and they are the ones that come to the top. So what we've shown is that the top predicted stimuli for the FFA, even from ImageNet and Places, they're all faces too. So despite searching through millions of images, we can't find stimuli predicted to strongly activate the FFA that aren't obviously faces. So what about the EBA? Well, when we are any of the top predicted stimuli for the EBA, not bodies, hence contrary evidence, uh, well, here are the top 10. At first, I wondered what that was. It's actually a picture of a dog on its back with its belly sticking up. So that's a, that's a body. It's not contrary evidence. And all of these are body images. That's the top 10. And here are the top 200. And you can see every one of them is a picture of body or a body part. Lots of trunks and hands and people in bikinis. That's what's in the uh, image data sets. Okay, what about the PPA? So we run the three and a half million images um, through the PPA model, here are the top 10. They are all places. And here are the top uh, 200. And having eyeballed the, um, uh, each image in the top 5,000 for each of these, uh, you see the same thing. So where have we gotten? We have used our highly accurate predictive models. I showed you in the first part that they're very accurate. We've used them to search through millions of images in an effort to find any stimuli that violate the claimed category selectivity for a given region. And we've just totally failed. And so I think that kind of suggests that that category selectivity is just true. Um, but we can make one more try. And that is we can try something else, which is we can use generative adversarial networks or GANs to synthesize stimuli designed to maximally activate the FFA, EBA, and PPA. And these GANs have been trained on uh, lots of natural images. Uh, and so they have this latent knowledge uh, that enables them to generate a uh, real world like stimuli. And so uh, we can ask, what do they generate for maximal stimuli for the FFA, PPA, and EBA? So what do you think? Well, let's look at what they generate for the FFA. That's what they generate. And they're pretty obviously all faces. What do they generate for the EBA? Well, they're kind of uh, abstract, but they're pretty clearly bodies and body parts, just like we knew the EBA liked. What do they generate for the PPA? Oh, well, they seem to like bridges and uh, wire link fences and phone poles and stuff like that. But anyway, they're all places that are generated here. So 
what have we done here? We have used powerful methods in an effort to falsify category selectivity, and we have just failed. So it seems like the category selectivity of the FFA, PPA, and EBA um, are withstanding very strong efforts to refute them. They may just be true. And I think that's really important for all these domain-specific theories in cognition and development and evolution that we can show there really are uh, bits of brain that are really selectively uh, engaged in or selectively responsive to faces, places, and bodies. And in part one, we have these nice abilities to uh, predict their exact responses. Now, there's, these models also enable us to do lots of cool things. Uh, for example, we can test models based on different uh, deep nets with different properties against neural data from each region. Um, and in that sense, we're using each model as a kind of embodied hypothesis about the architecture training and processing stages um, that, that uh, it's kind of an explicit hypothesis about the computations that produce the selectivity we see in each region. And so we can use that to find out which hypothesis best fits each region in the pathway leading to it. Okay. We can also use these models to try to understand the models by lesioning them and visualizing their feature selectivities and all these new methods that are coming along to try to interpret and understand what deep nets are doing. They're not black boxes anymore. There are all kinds of ways to understand what they're up to. We can also use these methods to discover novel functional selectivities of less understood regions in the brain and really figure out what those uh, less understood regions are actually selective for. And that's pretty cool too. So notice there's all this kind of uh, relatively uncharted stuff around those selective responses. Well, what are those regions doing? Who knows? But now we have a way to characterize what they're doing. Okay. But CNNs can also be used in a different way to ask what I think of as actually the most fundamental question in this space. And that's why do brains have category selectivity in the first place? Why from a computational point of view, is that a good way to design a brain? And why do we have the particular specializations we do for faces, places, and bodies, but not for lots of other things we've looked for like cars and food and snakes and other things for which you could tell a perfectly plausible story, we should have those things. Now, of course, we wouldn't expect brain specializations for tasks that neither we modern humans nor our evolutionary ancestors do. That would be silly to have a patch of brain sitting there uh, specialized for a function that nobody ever does. That isn't going to happen. Um, but of the space of functions that people do and that have mattered throughout evolution, there are a lot of things that don't apparently have specializations in the brain, like, like food and snakes. We've looked and we don't see these things. And so why do we have the ones we do and not some of these others? So this is work by my fantastic postdoc, Katarina Dobbs. And by the way, she's about to start her own lab in Gießen, Germany. Uh, and she's really great and she's going to um, do um, a lot of work along the lines I'm about to describe. And so if you're interested, go check out her website and get in touch with her. This work is also in collaboration with Alex Kell uh, and Julio Martinez. So first question, why is face recognition distinct from object recognition in the brain? Okay. So the first hypothesis we considered is that the ideal feature spaces for face and object recognition are just different. And so one system can't do both without a cost. So to test that, we started with the classic AlexNet from Krzyzewski, and we trained it on the VGG face database. So there's a thousand face identities and you train the hell out of it with face classifiers at the top end. And that makes what we're referring to as a face network. Um, and then what you can do is throw away the top layer and extract the features from the penultimate layer, train a classifier on different tasks to see what that feature space is good for. And then we can measure its ability to categorize novel faces that weren't part of its training set. And you see that it extracts features that work really well for um, discriminating novel features, nearly 100% correct. But here's the question, how's it gonna do on object discrimination? Answer, not, so we feed it objects, get their representations out of the top, run that, you know, run that through a uh, SVM classifier for objects, and it doesn't do very well. So that suggests that the features that are optimized for face recognition aren't very good for object recognition. What about vice versa? 
What about if we take the same network, we train it on lots of different object categories, not, not including animals or faces, um, and then we throw away the um, top layer, do the same thing, run it through a linear SVM to see how well those feature representations work for classifying faces and objects, and we find the opposite. It does pretty well at object classification, it does terribly at face classification. So what that seems to be telling us is that the optimum feature or the optimized feature space for faces doesn't work well for object recognition and vice versa. So maybe that's why we need different processors in the brain for faces and objects. Um, but we haven't yet done the strongest test. After all, all we did here was take something optimized just for face recognition and say, hey, does that work for object recognition? or take something optimized for object recognition and say, okay, does that work for face recognition? The stronger test will be to ask whether we can find a common feature space if we train one network on both tests. That would be giving it the best shot. So we tried that next. In addition to the two networks I just described, we had a fully shared dual task network um, that has just a concatenation of all the face class, class uh, categories and all the object categories at the top and we train it on faces and objects and faces and objects and alternating batches. And so now we can ask, how does this dual task network fare on these two tasks compared to the two singly trained networks? So first look at the singly, let's look at the singly trained networks. Now, since we have all the relevant categories at the top level, we, can, we don't need to use the SVM. We could just say, how accurate is it? Uh, and you can see that the face only network does uh, well on faces, the object only network you know, does okay on objects well above chance, but you know, it's a byproduct is an interesting um, thing to discover is that actually uh, one of the early arguments people made 10, 15 years ago about why we have specialized face regions in the brain is, well, maybe face recognition is just harder, so you need, need extra neurons to do it. Well, actually, uh, these face, face and object recognition tasks uh, in this network, the object task is actually harder, refuting that hypothesis. But our real question here is what about this shared network? How accurately does it do on faces and objects? And do we take a hit by trying to get one network to do both? And yes, we take a very big hit. There is a huge cost of sharing, of trying to get one network to do both of these things. And you can see that in the gray bars here. So that supports our hypothesis that the ideal feature space for faces and objects are just different. And so one system can't do both without a cost. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, and it raises a whole bunch of questions. So first, can some processing stages be shared? After all, in the primate visual system, we probably don't have separate parts of V1 and V2 for face and object recognition. Those are probably shared. And in the primate visual system, it seems like the branching happens later. So can that also work in networks? So we've only so far compared the um, completely dual trained network, which shares all layers. But what if we branched at different layers where, for example, here we would train all the first stages on both faces and objects and this branch only on faces and this branch only on objects. Or we might branch really early. So what do we find then? Here's what we see. So here is performance on the face task. The um, face only trained network is near 100% on uh, face discrimination. Um, and here's what we see for the dual train network as a function of the branch point. So if it branches early like this, performance is great. You can share the first layer, no problem. Even if it shares the first few convolutional layers, you still don't take a hit. Phases and objects can share the first few stages of processing. But by the time we get up to branching around COM4, COM5, we start to see a real drop in face categorization performance for the dual train network. And that shows that you cannot share all those stages without a cost. And if we look at the uh, performance on the object recognition task, here's object recognition in the object only uh, CNN, and here's performance in the dual trained network. Again, showing that you start to take a hit if you share um, more than the first few stages of the network. So all of that says that the early stages can be shared a whole lot like the primate visual system. Okay, second question, what about a larger network? AlexNet is by modern standards, a teeny little network. Um, if we have a larger network, can we then share both tasks without a cost? 
So next we took BGG and we did the same thing. We took the face only trained network, the object only trained network, and we looked at performance on face recognition um, in the face network and object recognition in the object network. And we then took the dual trained network, completely dual trained all the way up. And now we can ask, do we see a cost of sharing in this larger network? And the answer is no. So at first I was like, damn, I really liked that hypothesis and now it's out the window. But then on further thought, we started to think, wait a minute, how do we know what's going on here? Maybe that dual train network figured out its own spontaneous segregation into two distinct subnetworks or partly distinct networks. Maybe it discovered spontaneously the benefits of segregation. So how would we tell? Well, what we did was to first rank order units, take, take one layer at a time and rank order the units in that layer by how much removal of that unit hurts fa the face task. So that gives us a ranking of how important each unit or, or feature map is uh, for the face task. And then we drop the top 30% of them in each layer separately and we measure the drop in performance. And when we do that, here's what we see. So this is doing this separately at each layer. This is now showing you the drop in face recognition performance divided by the drop in object recognition performance. In other words, it's a measure of how selective the top ranked face units are for the face task. And you see at the top layers, a six fold higher drop in face recognition performance than object recognition performance if you pull out those face specialized units, okay? So that shows that this network actually did spontaneously segregate um, into a, with a separate bunch of units uh, for face processing. But now you might wonder, sensibly enough, well, maybe any two tasks, you could find segregation like this. So next we tried the same thing on a network trained on both uh, food categorization and object categorization. It's just like our face and object network, it's VGG but it's got at the top instead of food, uh, instead of objects and faces, it's got food categories, 100 food categories, uh, and around, I think, 400 object categories. And here's what we find. We find much less segregation, much less specificity of the top ranked food units. If you, if you lesion them, you, you, um, you get slightly more of a hit in performance on the food task and the object task. Um, but, um, but to much less evidence for segregation. And same deal when we trade a network on both car classification, you know, a thousand car categories and uh, around 400 object categories. Again, we see much less um, segregation or specialization of the, you know, when we fish out the, the most car causally involved units, they don't produce a much stronger hit for car classification than object classification. So what all of this is telling us is that there's something special about faces, that task segregation for faces is stronger and uh, emerges earlier in the pathway than any segregation we see for food and car processing in the network. Okay, question three, do these models capture behavioral judgments? So here's a behavioral RDM, and if you haven't heard of those, this is a dissimilarity matrix. And so what we do is we have a way of um, using Mechanical Turk to get people's judgments of the perceptual similarity of a large number of pairs of faces. So what we have here is 16 different faces with multiple images of each on each axis, and each cell in here shows you um, perceptual dissimilarity that subjects uh, rate in a, in a task uh, between those two. So you can see this diagonal, these, these purple diagonals are the low dissimilarity, that is high similarity, uh, for all the different images of uh, Marilyn Streep, all the different images of somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. Here are 16 identities. And then you see also these you know, four bluish squares. It seems to divide itself into men, women, young and old. Um, and so now we can ask, this is a kind of way of depicting your internal represent, you know, perceptual representational space for faces or for these 16 faces or, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, and uh, here's what we get, we can do the same thing 
by looking at the similarity of representations in each layer of a network. So this is for uh, fully connected layer eight in VGG, and you can see it's pretty similar to behavior. Now the question is, how does that match to behavior change as you go across layers? And what you see is as you go up in layers, you get a better match. The face network matches face behavior, um, approaching the, uh, the noise ceiling and, and behavior up here. So that's a face-only network. But now the question is how well does, um, if you look at the object network, it doesn't do anywhere near as well. But the real question is how well does the dual task network do? And the answer it does is it does great. It does as well as the face-only network at the upper stages and as well as the object network, which is kind of trained more broadly on the earlier stages. And conversely, if we look at a comparable kind of object task and we look at its match to behavior, we see that it matches the object task, um, but it also uh, matches the dual task CNN really well. So what we see here is that the face CNN explains face but not object behavior and vice versa, and the dual task CNN captures both. So nice match to behavior. And so what we've shown here is that face and object recognition may be distinct in the brain and the mind, because there is no common feature space that's adequate for both. And so next, we wanna ask more generally whether we see in networks automatic segregation for places and objects, and for bodies and objects, and for other kinds of things we see in the brain. And more generally, we wanna ask how much of the organization we see in the brain, how many of these functionally specialized regions in the brain seem to arise for similar regions, reasons um, because that is just what an optimized system will do is segregate that process because it's a fundamentally different task or feature space. Uh, there's already work from Alex Kell and Josh McDermott uh, using um, deep nets uh, to look at processing of speech and music and showing that they also show some segregation, uh, necessary segregation from optimum performance. And so we can ask more broadly, what about social cognition and language? What about syntax and semantics? What about, what about? We can ask to what extent we can predict the functional organization of the brain from what we see in the pattern of task optimizations in deep nets, and whether that can account for why we see the functional organization we do. And I just wanna end by recrediting the people who really did this work, Ratan Murthy and Katerina Dobbs, uh, and my wonderful lab, who is it's full of smart, skilled, awesome, fun people who are willing to do uh, all kinds of crazy things with me. And I will end there, say thank you, and I will take questions. There's a nice little conversation going on. Uh, we'll get you to chime in. This is from Varun Wadia. Do you believe that faces are special? Recent work from Dorsau shows that selective responses to faces at a single neuron level in monkeys falls out of cells acting as linear projectors in object space. Do you feel that we have evolved to have uh, dedicated processing mechanisms for faces? It's a great question. Um, and I think we don't know. I think what this work shows is that faces are special in some sense uh, at least with respect to the other categories we've tested so far. They're specialer uh, than food and then cars. And I think that, you know, the kind of account that Doris's lovely paper suggests is that when a set of stimuli are kind of clustered in that object space that she also drives from a, a deep net, um, that, that maybe it's just their clustering in that space leads them to get their own patch. And I think that uh, we're now looking at the degree to which uh, cars and food are clustered. Uh, cars are more, um, uh, more clustered than faces. Or actually, what do we find? Uh, cars are more clustered than food, uh, but food shows more segregation in our networks than cars. And so I think that's an interesting hypothesis, but it is not going to account for all the data we have. Now, that doesn't mean that there's something uh, evolutionarily built in and innate about faces. There might be, but it doesn't require that hypothesis. It could be that there's something else about the task of face recognition per se uh, that any system will discover. In fact, to some extent, the fact that we get the segregation in a network is a kind of existence proof that it is possible for that thing 
uh, to segregate without building in any domain specific biases. So we're just looking at, you know, we're trying to use this to say, what does an optimized system do? Uh, we're not so far modeling either evolution or development, but it does uh, raise interesting questions, suggesting that you may not need to build in specialized systems to get uh, segregation for faces. And I think all of that will be better addressed in the, in the near future with some of these newer models, unsupervised training models that are, are better models for development. And, uh, and we're looking at all of that, but don't have answers yet. Great, thanks. Uh, the next one is from Isan Misagi. Uh, it seems like the assumption here was that the brain works exactly like CNNs. Would there be a way for us to test this without having that assumption? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I don't think that's an assumption. I think it's a, um, it's a hypothesis in a way, right? That beautiful prediction that I showed in the first part actually knocked my socks off. Like that did not have to be, like it just didn't have to work, right? And um, so the fact that it does work um, to me suggests that there's some appreciable fit between properties of these networks and the brain, right? And we're not the first to show that. As I mentioned, it's, you know, starting with the Yamans and DiCarlo 2014 paper and then a whole bunch of papers since then have shown a uh, pretty good fit. So I think it's kind of an empirical result that, that these systems uh, seem to capture a lot of brain data surprisingly well. That said, there are all kinds of things they don't capture, right? So there's all kinds of stimuli outside the training set here uh, that they don't capture, like stick figures of bodies, don't produce high predictive responses in our uh, EBA models, but they do in the brain. And we're looking at that now and trying to figure out what that might mean. So I think we're in this very interesting productive um, situation where it's, there's enough fit that it's really worth working with and yet there's not total fit. So there's so much more to be done to use these models in this iterative cycle uh, to try to make better models that fit the brain better. And I, and I also wanna say that we've considered he, only so far the kind of classic feed forward deep nets. And there's a huge space of other things from just adding in recurrence to using generative models of the kind that Josh Tenenbaum was talking about this morning um, to all kinds of other models. And the, you know, it, so long as they're neurally interpretable in the sense that you can stick an image in and get unit responses so that you can build the kind of models we talked about, um, we can test them. And so I think it's not so much an assumption. It's, it's, like it's, it's like a working hypothesis that's already working pretty well and we can keep testing it and keep figuring out how we can make it better. Great, thanks. Uh, the next one's already had some potential answers for him, but uh, just in case you want to add anything to it, Anthony starts, on top of running millions of images, would it be possible to probe the network to generate the optimal stimuli for the FFA, uh, i.e. optimize pixel space input to maximize the output FFA score? Very curious to know what that would look like. And he followed up saying that since this was basically already answered by the GAN part of your talk. Yeah, that was exactly game. what we're trying to do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do the GAN result give higher FFA score compared to the original natural face training images? And Varun oh. pointed to Gabrielle's paper in Cell, but in case yep. you want to pay. Yep, yep. Um, so yeah, absolutely. That's what we were up to with the GAN model. Um, we have not had a chance to go back and measure uh, responses there. Um, the, uh, yeah, does it, have we fed those GAN images into the um, original prediction? That's a very good question and stupidly, I can't, I'm sure that Ratan has done that and just shoot me an email and I'll give you an answer to that. I'm sure he's tried it. Um, but whatever we find, I mean, it might be cool if it's a little bit higher, but it doesn't really engage with the hypothesis because those stimuli are so clearly members of the category. Um, and yes, as, uh, as you alluded to, this work has a lot of similarities to the, um, to the well, there's the um, uh, Bashevan de Carlo lab paper and the Ponce et al. paper that Gabrielle and Marge Livingstone were on that came out about the same time. They also used GAN models uh, to make predictions. And um, I'd be interested in Gabrielle's thoughts on this. My take from scrutinizing, I don't know, figure three or whatever it was, I can't remember, uh, is that they had a, a face, um, a sort of face selective cell and they, their GAN model produced something that's kind of in the intermediate gray zone that, that uh, doesn't quite produce a stronger response um, uh, by a non-face than a face, but it's getting close. And so that's very much the same kind of thing we're trying to do here um, with, by trying to you know, 
re, you know, make an effort to refute these hypotheses. And uh, so far, I think they're passing, but we'll keep at it. Great. Uh, the next one's from AJ. Uh, going forward in man's quest to, of building AGI, or I should say in humankind's quest of building AGI, do you believe we should have three different models, one each performing the function of FFA, PPA, and EVA? Or is it possible to have one model that can do all three? Well, I think what, okay, so within the space of what we've tested so far, which is, you know, we haven't done this on every, you know, architecture that's out there and the architectures that are out there are a small subset, so they're possible architectures. So we can't say that every optimized system will do this, but what we can say is the ones we've tested, um, which we've also done, uh, what, ResNet 50, I think Julio's in the middle of running that right now and it's producing the same results. So, so for, you know, AlexNet and DGG and ResNet 50, um, which is a reasonably broad sampling of the standard feed forward networks, um, we find that those systems require some segregation for optimum performance. Whether that will be globally true for any possible system, it's a great question. And uh, the only way I know to go at that is to, you know, uh, iterate and test other kinds of models. Great. Uh, there's a quick little follow-up on that to, from Quaja with all. To add further to the question, do we need specific function works for specific functions that the brain performs, but even having specific areas dedicated for specific tasks? We at least know, uh, we at least now know that these networks work in integration with each other to do a task, e.g. recognizing your mother and having the emotional response generated from amygdala involves visual cortex, fusiform gyrus, and the amygdala. So what's your view on this? Okay, well, first let me clarify what, um, what I mean by functional specificity. What I mean by functional specificity is that for some patches of the cortex, probably a, a minority, but for a, a reasonable number of them, the function of that patch is highly specific. That doesn't mean that face recognition, all of it, the whole deal, is accomplished by that little patch of cortex alone. Can't possibly be. It needs pre-processing in V1. It needs a retina to serve up the information, it needs an output system to enable you to use the information. So everything we do requires many different regions of the brain all interacting with each other. The question here is just an effort to understand one piece of brain at a time and isolate its particular function. And I think what we're doing here is showing that for at least some of those regions, those functions are A, highly specific, B, um, modelable uh, pretty well by deep nets, um, and C, in some cases, um, seem to make sense as a separate function, given that optimized deep nets will also produce that segregation. Great, thanks. Uh, the next one is from Quan Wan. Uh, we know the category selected for by uh, FFA is faces, but what do you think is the cognitive computations carried out by the FFA? FFA? To me, distinguishing between faces is different from face recognition, which involves associating a face to an identity in long-term memory, which is very different from the haptics or acoustics evidence, which you uh, didn't present in this talk, which is saying FFA is responding to some sensory input from the surface of the spherical thing on top of, of the head. Is the FFA doing just uh, anything face E or generally, generally cognitizing about faces? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's embarrassing that I don't have better answers having worked on the damn thing for a couple decades at this point. Um, what, I, what I can say is that I think it's causally involved in your perceptual representation of a face, and that happens in all kinds of ways. And you look at a face, it's, it is you know, a big part of your subjective experience of what that face look like, looks like lives there. And we know that not just from um, analyses of responses of that region, we know that from the few cases where we get to causally test its role, as in patients who have damage to that region and can't distinguish one phase from another, um, or um, in that talk that I mentioned, the beer talk, the Heineken talk, uh, I include a video of a uh, patient undergoing neurosurgery who was electrically stimulated in that location while looking at faces, and the, his response is that the appearance of the face changes. Right, so we also know that if you close your eyes and imagine a face, you turn on that region. And so all of these things involve perceptually representing uh, the appearance of a face. So I think, you know, that's, that's a word model. 
Um, but I think that's what its primary role is. Now, I think it will be engaged in all kinds of other things. Sometimes when you're doing you know, high level thinking about a person, you may have a mental image of them. It will turn on in that case. I don't think it's involved in typical adults with standard you know, uh, experience. I don't think it's involved in high level uh, social cognition other than that it may ancillarily go along if you're mentally imaging faces while you're doing that task. So I really think it is a perceptual processing system that is representing the appearance of the face. Great, thanks. Uh, the next one is from uh, Karthik Balakrishnan. In the VGG network, you showed that there is a segregation of the network for the classification between faces and objects, whereas not so much for food versus objects or cars versus objects. What do you define as objects here? A car is also an object. Would you also work, uh, would it also work Oh, it just jumped on me, sorry. Would it also work if we compare the faces of animals uh, versus human faces? Yeah, so there's a wide open space of things here and we've only just begun this. So we haven't done all of those. Um, and objects, you know, it's just a placeholder. It's not a deep, you know, it's just a word that we stick on a bunch of stimuli, right? So um, uh, the objects that we used in our studies, we, we pulled out all the, you know, obvious face human animal labels because animal images have animal faces. Um, and so they're, they're um, you know, they're all inanimate objects. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, there's a wide open array of questions about which other segregations we'll see. So in Katerina's lab, she's going to ask other questions like, okay, would you expect using the same kind of idea? Suppose you train a network on facial expression discrimination and face identity discrimination. Would you expect that to spontaneously segregate into, into two different networks? What if you have dynamic uh, stimulus information, which is really important in uh, high level social perception of faces or brain regions up in the superior temporal sulcus up here that respond very selectively to moving faces, much more to, than to static faces or to moving anything else. And they seem to be more involved in extracting high level social information. And so what is that all about? Well, these are all things that are kind of wide open to be tested with these methods, whether deep networks trained on those kinds of tasks also show similar kinds of spontaneous segregation. And I will be deeply tickled if that turns out to be true. And if not, well, it may turn out that this is only a narrow explanation for why we have an FFA, uh, not a broader explanation for all the functional organization of the brain. It's bound to not explain the whole thing, but I'm hopeful it'll take us pretty far and we'll see. Great, and we have time for one more question. Here's another one from Kwaja. Uh, as you have shown that FFA is highly selective to faces, my question is, is which neural pathways from FFA are responsible for face recognition? Is it any way related to its proximity to parahippocampal gyrus, which is known to play an important role uh, in memory encoding and retrieval? Yeah, it's a great question. I am extremely frustrated by our lack of knowledge of uh, long range connectivity in the human brain. I have a very outlier position on this. Most people think we already know all of this. There's been the human connectome project and there's DTI and there's resting functional correlations. But uh, we spent a couple of years in my lab getting the best possible data we could from both resting functional correlations and diffusion tractography to try to actually first find out the damn anatomical connections uh, you know, is OFA directly connected to the FFA? Is FFA connected to anterior? There's other face selective regions in the anterior temporal lobe. Is it connected to medial temporal regions? All that kind of stuff I would love to know. Uh, and I think in humans, we basically don't have the answer to those questions. We have some kind of sort of a little bit answers from resting functional data. They're highly imperfect. Um, in monkeys, we do have that information. And by we, I mean Doris Tsao and her lab has actually nailed that. In monkeys, you can do these, you know, horrible invasive studies where you inject tracers and see where they go in the brain. And that tells you absolutely there is an anatomical connection. And so she's mapped that out in detail with the face system in monkeys. And that's gorgeous work. And we are just in the dark ages in the study of the human brain. I think we just don't know what's connected to what. And it's really frustrating. So any of you people with technical skills, go out and invent methods so we can actually discover the long range uh, connectivity in the human brain. That would be a huge gift to the field. Awesome, thank you very much for this wonderful talk, Nancy. My pleasure, if people have other questions, feel free to shoot me an email.